my name is Dr. Kimberly Davis, Senior Research Scientist and the Director of Community Outreach for the Center for Cancer Research and Therapeutic Development at Clark Atlanta University. I welcome you to this edition of Life Notes. Today we will talk with our guests about kidney cancer. Kidney cancer, also called renal cancer, is a disease in which kidney cells become malignant and grow out of control, forming a tumor. Your kidneys are two bean-shaped organs, each about the size of your fist. They are located behind your abdominal organs with one kidney on each side of your spine. Almost all kidney cancers first appear in the linking of the tiny tubes in the kidney. The good news is that most kidney cancers are found before they spread to distant organs. And cancers caught early are easier to treat successfully. However, these tumors can grow to be quite large before they are detected. Doctors don't know the cause of kidney cancer, but certain factors appear to increase the risk of getting kidney cancer. These are some of the risk factors for kidney cancer. Smoking, being over the age of 40, being male, being obese, using certain pain medications for a long time, having advanced kidney disease, having certain genetic conditions, having a family history of kidney cancer, being exposed to certain chemicals, having high blood pressure, being African American, and having lymphoma. Having these risk factors does not mean you will get kidney cancer, and it's also true that you can have none of them and still get the disease. Our host, Paulette Payne, sat down with our guest to talk more about kidney cancer. She joins us now with more. Thank you, Dr. Davis. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, kidney disease is the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. I'm joined today by Dr. Khalid Bashir to find out why the disease is so prevalent among African Americans, your risk factors, and much more. Dr. Bashir, thank you so much for joining us today on Life Notes. Thank you, Paula. Thanks for having me on your show. So talk to me about kidney disease. What is it exactly? So kidney disease is uh, any dysfunction, whether it's a structural or functional abnormality in kidney, which is, uh, most people know, is the f uh, filtering fraction uh, unit of uh, our body through which the blood passes um, at uh, uh, some time and uh, cleans the blood uh, of its uh, uh, toxic products and uh, also uh, removes fluid from our bodies. And so when kidney disease develops, what are some of the symptoms you've, you've seen in patients? Uh, symptoms, uh, that's the bad thing about kidney disease. So when we have our early stage, when we see our patients with early stage kidney disease, they could practically be asymptomatic. So uh, as uh, their uh, uh, chronic kidney disease progresses, that's what we call CKD, as it progresses, then they uh, can either remain asymptomatic uh, but as they advance in their uh, kidney state, uh, the stage of the kidney stage wor worsens to stage four, stage five, then they become symptomatic. And uh, most of these symptoms uh, initially are kind of non-specific symptoms, which could be seen in other disease states, could be just uh, feeling tired, weakness, uh, fatigue, uh, loss of appetite, um, anorexia, hiccups, and as the disease state progresses, more advanced kidney stage disease could have symptoms related to the fluid overload, elevated blood pressure, buildup of acid in the body, potassium elevation. So those are really uh, severe symptoms that develop towards the uh, you know, advanced end stage kidney disease. Now, of and course, it, these are some of the advanced symptoms. Right. On the front end, though, what, what should patients look for? Are there s certain masses that develop in the body? What specifically, if, if, a, if there's a history of, of kidney disease in the family? Uh, not masses as such, uh, because it's not a, not a tumor in the body. So kidney uh, disease, uh, as I mentioned, could be asymptomatic. So what really uh, is needed, uh, the, the overall prevalence of kidney disease in the general population is low. So there's not a mass screening uh, for kidney disease that is recommended. Uh, what is recommended is to screen those patients who have the risk factors for kidney disease. And the most common of them would be diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, someone who has a family history of uh, kidney disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, then uh, cardiovascular risk factors, which could be high lipids, uh, 
uh, obesity, smoking, infections like uh, HIV, hepatitis, diseases like sickle cell uh, malignancies. So those are uh, people who are at high risk of chronic kidney disease. So in them, it is recommended, as is recommended by National Kidney Foundation, uh, their guidelines, um, which is also endorsed by a global initiative known as KDGO uh, from 2006. Both of them recommend a screening of high-risk population uh, with two simple tests. One would be a, uh, a morning urine sample to look for any protein leakage albumin leakage, and the other is a simple blood test measuring the serum creatinine, um, which is used to calculate the GFR, which is the, uh, the measure of the uh, filtration rate of the kidney. And so once the, the patient has been diagnosed, all these tests have been conducted, what then is the next step in, in their treatment? So the next step before you go to treatment is really to uh, put them, uh, classify their disease see what, which class of disease they are and uh, they're again coming from National Kidney Foundation they have their guidelines known as NKFK DOKI guidelines which classifies kidney disease into five stages stage one two three four and five one would be somewhere you know who has preserved kidney function as measured by the GFR but some protein leakage or some other abnormality in the kidney then as you advance two three four and five five would be when the GFR function is less than 15. So uh, so that would be the class. When you put them into different classes, there's a specific goal and treatment option for each stage of kidney disease then. And you brought up a, a very good point, treatment options. What are, what are those uh, options patients can choose? Treatment from? options is really based upon uh, treating, first of all, the risk factor that is associated. If patient is a diabetic, control their diabetes. If patient has high blood pressure, controlling their high blood pressure. Uh, then as they advance towards in their uh, staging of kidney disease, as they move from stage one towards stage five, there are various complications associated with, with it. Uh, some of them would be like uh, development of anemia because uh, kidney, uh, believe it or not, is responsible for secreting a hormone known as erythropoietin. So that erythropoietin production goes down and patients can become anemic. And so you have to target uh, their anemia with a injection of erythropoietin, so that's one. Uh, as they, again, as they develop uh, more towards advanced kidney disease, they could develop bone mineral disease, which is uh, related to the kidneys and a, a gland in, one, in the neck, uh, which is close to the thyroid, not the thyroid, parathyroid gland. Uh, the secretion of that increases, that makes kidney disease patients uh, more prone to uh, um, bone and mineral disease, so you have to target that. Then it could be other things, you know, fluid buildup, they get swollen, uh, they have high blood pressure as a result of that. So you target their fluid buildup by way of diuretics, restricting salt, restricting fluids. So there's no single, you know, uh, treatment that I can tell you. Each patient is different and you have to target different things. Sure, sure. Some of the um, underlining causes for kidney disease, um, your high blood pressure, or your diabetes, it sounds like some of these things can be prevented uh, through diet and other means. Can you talk about that? Are there any pre preventive me measures, excuse yeah, me? Yeah, some of the, you know, I don't think most of these can be prevented. Uh, some can be modified, yes, controlled better. Uh, so what is really needed, as I mentioned early on, first of all, to screen people who have these risk factors for kidney disease. Once it's established, they have kidney disease. And so then the, the key is to slow the progression of the kidney disease. And why is it important to slow the progression of the kidney disease? Because uh, as the kidney disease progresses, these people are more prone to cardiovascular disease. They are uh, uh, more prone to uh, infection causes, more prone to malignancies, and also more prone to develop end-stage renal disease when that's when they require some form of renal replacement therapy. So the target is blood pressure control, diabetic control. Uh, if they're leaking proteins, then uh, and plus they have high blood pressure and are diabetic, then it becomes easy. There's a well-known class of drugs uh, known as ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers that slows the progression of the kidney disease, that controls blood pressure, 
as well as lowers the protein leakage from the, uh, from the kidneys. Then um, there are other measures you can uh, do to control their uh, volume buildup, fluid buildup by way of giving them diuretics, uh, managing their anemia as I mentioned earlier by giving them erythropoietin injections. If they have acid buildup in the body, managing that uh, with medications. Um, so those are some of the measures. And obviously diet, dietary modification because people with kidney disease cannot take a regular diet. Very rarely can they take a regular diet. They're very salt sensitive, so you have to restrict salt in them. Uh, you have to restrict potassium because the potassium in the body can go higher, uh, so they have to be on a low potassium diet. Protein restriction uh, may or may not be needed because if you restrict too much of proteins, their albumin goes down. That's again associated with higher morbidity, mortality, uh, increased chance of disease or dying from it. On the other hand, if you give them too much of proteins, their kidneys are obviously will have to work more. That can lead to a kind of a, a overworking of the kidneys, more function, more scarring, and more damage. And so, it, it sounds like sometimes you know if you if you give too much treatment, it can have an adverse effect. If you get if you undertreat, it could have an adverse effect. That's, that's very true. As I mentioned, the, this class of drugs, ACE inhibitors, you may have heard uh, commonly used drug lisinopril. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a good medication. It has all the benefits, but sometimes you can get uh, side effects from that. You can uh, p people uh, patients can develop an allergic reaction to it. A dry hacking cough um, occurs from that. Similarly, diuretics can have uh, deleterious effects on the body. Too much of potassium wasting, cramping in the body. Sometimes people uh, lose too much fluid from the body that they become volume depleted. Uh, blood pressure medications can, you know, drop the blood pressure sometimes too low. So it, that's why, you know, once people develop this um, kidney disease, especially at stage three and beyond, at that time they need to be carefully washed and especially they should be referred uh, to someone who is uh, trained in kidney disease and management of high blood pressure. Now, Dr. Bashir, we were talking uh, before the show about kidney disease in relation to kidney cancer. Um, of course, on Life Notes, we like to focus on cancers that disproportionately impact the African-American community. And it's my understanding that those who develop kidney disease have a risk factor of developing kidney cancer. Can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, yes, uh, the kidney cancer, uh, one that is most common, which occurs in about, eight, which are, accounts for 80 to 85 percent of uh, all cancers, is a cancer known as renal cell carcinoma. So that's very common. Then there are others, but this is a cancer within the kidney. And uh, the known risk factors for cancers, uh, if you remember earlier on, I mentioned what are the risk factors for kidney disease. And the known risk factors for cancers are kind of similar. There's a lot of similarity. For example, uh, people who are obese, who smoke, uh, uh, who have uh, uh, diabetes is not really uh, proven, uh, but who have acquired cysts. Acquired cyst is one that is really well known. Uh, when someone develops advanced kidney disease and they reach uh, end stage, they are on dialysis. So in these dialysis uh, patients, cysts develop in both kidneys, and uh, about 30 to 50 percent of dialysis patients develop these cysts, which are not cancerous, but this puts them at a higher category to develop tumors. 30 times risk is increased in these dialysis patients to develop this cancer, which I mentioned is renal cell carcinoma. So you see a lot of common uh, of risk factors for both kidney disease and the development of cancers. And I'm glad you spoke to that because I'm sure our viewers would be interested to know what that correlation is. Uh, correlation between? Between the kidney, kidney, kidney disease kidney. and kidney cancer. And you spoke to that right. quite well. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for joining us, but don't go away. Okay. We're going to be right back with more Life Notes after this. Okay. We'll be joined by a very special survivor. It's time to join forces, get energized, and fuel up right. And it's because starting today, every kid in America has a mission. Bring out 
the action hero in you. Be part of the greatest action movie ever. The first movie that puts you in the action. Show us how you train and eat like an action hero. Join in at actionheroalliance.com. We got the spirit, we're hot, we can't be stopped. We got the spirit, we're hot, we can't be stopped. We're gonna beat them and bust them. The beat smallest beat moments beat can have the biggest beat impact beat on a child's beat life. Take time to be a dad today. Call or visit fatherhood.gov to learn more. Keep innocent things from triggering an asthma attack. Please make the monsters go away. Learn how to stop their asthma attacks at noattacks.org. CAUTV, educating and entertaining since 1982. Disaster strikes without warning. What if life as you know it has completely turned on its head? What if everything familiar becomes anything but? Before a disaster turns your family's world upside down, it's up to you to be ready. Get a kit. Make a plan. Be informed today. Learn how at ready.gov. Welcome back to Life Notes. In the last segment, we heard from kidney disease expert, Dr. Khalid Bashir, about the signs and risk factors associated with the disease. Now we're joined by Margaret Ramos to talk about her experiences as a kidney transplant survivor. Margaret, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Now we were talking before the show about your experiences. Can you talk to us a little bit about what happened? What, what led to the point where you had to become a kidney transplantee? Well, I was not diagnosed until I was in my 40s. I had shown no symptoms of the typical disease. I had no high blood pressure, no blood in the urine, no um, back or flank pain. But what happened was I noticed a growth in my abdomen. And my doctor sent me to get a CT scan thinking that it was probably cancer, but it was not. It turns out I have a disease called polycystic kidney and liver disease. This is a hereditary disease in about 90% of um, people. It passes down from generation to generation. You have a 50% chance of passing it. In my particular case, I was a, in that 10%, I was a spontaneous mutation. So I had no one in my family so no idea that there could be kidney disease. And um, after the CT scan, they told me that I had um, polycystic kidney disease and put me in touch with a nephrologist. Did you have any idea what this meant? Well, I like to do research, so <laughs> I quickly found um, the Polycystic Kidney Foundation site, and they are a wealth of information, and they let me know about the cyst and what the causes are, and at this point there was no cure, although the foundation is doing a lot of work. So um, I found that I had 
large cyst in my kidneys and and with working with my nephrologist we started a um, started working on a diet and exercise plan and I was in stage three when we actually found it stage three stage three and so then of course you became a candidate for uh, a kidney transplant I did it took about 10 years we were able to control it with diet and exercise I ended up having some of the flank pain I ended up having the anemia and having to have um, treatment for that and high blood pressure before I ended up at end-stage renal and I was a good candidate for the transplant because I had no other health um, underlying issues whatsoever and was actually in extremely good health and that's perfect. That's a perfect condition to be in in, in situations like this. Well, can you share with us who was your donor? Uh, it was a wonderful story. I had a, I was an avid and still am an avid tennis player, and I had a tennis partner that, unbeknownst to me, went in and tested. And matter of fact, I had just received the first of June notification that I was going to be accepted onto the transplant, the UNOS list, and it would be published as of the 30th. My family, I had no matches. Everybody else in the family, my husband's B positive, and, and as with, if you don't know, you have to have a match with your blood type. And all of my children were B positive. My mother and father were an O and a B, and everybody else in my family were Bs. My, so we had no family whatsoever that had the same blood type that I did. And my friend turned out to be a perfect match, and she surprised me at lunch. On the way back from getting the fistula put in my arm, she, she told me, and quite an emotional lunch. Wow, <laughs> the perfect match, tennis players. What a, what a wonderful way to end this story. Yes. So how are you feeling these days? I feel wonderful. I have some side effects from the medications, but that's to be expected. You know, that's a very small price to pay for the fact that you have life. And so, you know, everybody ends up with a few things, but it's just such a gift to be able to have a, a well and full life now. And so for those who might have to get a, get a kidney transplant because of kidney disease, there is life after this. There's wonderful life after this, and the, they're making so many strides with the medications as far as how long you can um, expect to live. You know, n nothing's a guarantee in life, but I have been fortunate to meet many people now that have lived over 25 years with their first transplant. That is amazing. That is amazing. Margaret, thank you for sharing this wonderful story. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Bashir, I'd like to turn to you really quickly. Uh, briefly, can you talk to us about why kidney disease is so prevalent in the African American community? Well, that's a very important question. Uh, you know, we at Morehouse and Grady um, see so much of African American population. Um, there are several racial and ethnic differences, both in the incidence and uh, prevalence of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. Uh, just to give an example, uh, I would you know, highlight uh, the, the differences. In 2005, the incident rate for end-stage renal disease uh, in Caucasians was about 260 per million patient population. But in African Americans, that rate is four times higher, about almost 1,000 uh, per million patient population. Uh, so the highest prevalence rate for kidney disease is African American population, followed by uh, American Indians, uh, Alaskan Natives, followed by American Asian, Asian Americans, um, and Hawaiian Natives, followed by Caucasian. So clearly, African Americans much higher uh, incidence and prevalence than uh, Caucasian uh, males. So what what is the what are the factors? Uh, uh, not much is known, but a lot has been known recently. Genetic factors play a, a, a predominant role. There could be other socioeconomic uh, factors. Uh, there could be uh, a difference in the, the availability uh, or disproportionate availability of uh, health care to African Americans, which leads to you know 
not an adequate management of chronic kidney disease with the result there is more rapid progression in the African American population. Uh, so coming back to that genetic factor, uh, there are at least two genes that have been known. There are more, uh, a lot of them are being looked at. One is an MYH9 gene. There's a genetic mutation on that. And the other one which is more interesting and uh, a lot of interest uh, uh, has been uh, evoked on that gene that is known as, as an apolipoprotein, ApoL1 uh, gene. So what that gene is, it imparts uh, a higher risk of kidney disease in African Americans. So there's an interesting story about this ApoL1 gene. Uh, it is predominantly seen in people of African descent. So in the, um, you know, the Sahara and the Kalamari uh, uh, deserts, uh, this gene, the ApoL1 gene, kind of imparts a protection uh, to the population there because there's a trypanosomal infection uh, which is spread by a fly known as CC fly. That CC fly can transmit this trypanosomal infection uh, known as serum sickness. So the, this genetic mutation in Africa kind of pro mm -hmm. provides immunity for this serum sickness. So now move to US, same population when they move to US, this gene, the genetic mutation in this ApoL1 gene uh, imparts a, a higher risk of developing kidney disease. So that's kind of a fascinating story uh, that uh, has developed more recently and that puts them at a seven to ten times higher risk of developing end staging disease. And there are several other factors but these are the main ones. Certainly and thank you for sharing that fascinating information with us. I'm sure our viewers will benefit from from your knowledge. Thank Dr. You. Bashir and Margaret be inspired by your story. Continued health, continued life and keep playing tennis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on Life Notes today. To find out more about the work at the CCRTD, please visit www.cau.edu. Join us next time for more Life Notes. Thank you, Paula. And on behalf of the CCRTD, I hope you have enjoyed this edition of Life Notes. We would like to thank our guests for sharing their expertise with us. If you or someone you know has been diagnosed with cancer, the CCRTD is available to assist you in navigating your healthcare needs and choices. The CCRTD has access to a network of organizations and facilities that enable us to keep you informed of the latest advances, treatments, and information in the medical community. We can help you find answers to any questions you may have regarding your condition or healthcare needs. To learn more about the CCRTD and the services we offer, please contact us at 404 880-6878 or via email at www.cancerinfo at cau.edu.